is Johnny. So Johnny, you've got something for us this morning. Would you mind? Yeah, hi, it's me again. <laughs> um, it's more of a rambling actually this morning. Um, on Wednesday, I put my hand in the pocket of my fleece um, and found two acorns that I'd picked up somewhere and I just love them. Acorns are aesthetically beautiful seeds as are conkers and sweet chestnuts. Um, next time you have the opportunity, pick up a seed and just look at it, it's, it's beautiful. I'm always picking up seeds and planting them. Uh, I've got a thriving forest in our very, very small back garden. Trees bring me great joy. And I think it stems from the time I spent in the rainforest in Borneo. Ever since then, whenever I'm amongst trees, I feel happy and calm. Now you may be aware, you may not, but you may be aware it was my 60th birthday on Monday and Jenny's plans to take me on some grand adventure had to be scaled back because of lockdown. So Jenny organized a time slot for us to visit Tintersfield. The house was closed, but the gardens are open and, and full of the beautiful autumn colors of trees preparing for winter ahead. And it lifted my spirits at what feels like a particularly dark time for the world. It felt like the darkness is passing away and the real light is already shining, as it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. This is a chance to be optimistic. Look at the changes we're experiencing in our normal lives as opportunities, not as problems. This feels like, the, the, this feels like they're changing, albeit slowly. There are changes in America, changes in China, and very definitely changes in this country. Whenever I think of darkness and light, I think of the line in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Let's pray. Transforming God, whose light always penetrates the darkness and whose love always overcomes hate, we ask that you sustain us as we struggle to make your light visible in an angry and frightened world. Nurture us daily as we work for your justice in, in unjust places and your peace in places where no peace is to be found. Give us courage and strength when we're fearful and weak. Give us hope and forgiveness when we feel hopeless and angry and guide us every step of the way as we walk toward the light. God of all creation, we praise you for you are the one who created all things, the trees, the earth, the light, the autumn colors, the life within the trees. God of sunrises in the midst of what feels like an eternal night of the soul, we praise you for you are the one who causes the sun to rise. When the disciples felt the despair of Holy Saturday with the Jesus inside the darkness of the tomb, you were there. And soon the light of the new day would arise and your triumph over death and despair would be brought into the light. Thank you for always being a light in the dark places of the world and the dark places of our lives. Our hope is in God for you are the light of the world and you call us to be lights for others. May your light and your love blaze in us and all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we're going to sing our first hymn, which isn't on the song sheet, but uh, our first hymn, The Lord is My Shepherd. Thank you. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want He makes me lie in pastures green He leads me by the still, still waters His goodness restores my soul and I will trust in you alone and I will trust in you alone for your endless mercy follows me your goodness will lead me 
guides my ways in righteousness, and He anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy. I feast on His pure. Johnny. Thank you very much. That couldn't be more on message if you tried. What a fantastic start to our service to remind us of the light that there is. We've talked quite a lot about our own situation and how that's reflected in God's word. And we've recognised that one of the things that we really need to be doing, because we are in a time of transition, is listening to God. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we listened to one of those videos uh, which are on the Baptist Union website or you can access through the Fuelcast. I'd like us to listen to another one now. All of these little videos are only about 10, 15 minutes long, 12 minutes, I think, at most. And they are each person's individual take on what we should be hearing from God, on how we should be listening and what he might be saying to us in these most difficult of times. Now, the one that I'm going to play to you is another friend of mine. Haley and I were at college together. I have to say, uh, I find the music behind her quite loud and quite distracting. So just to uh, warn you, it does start with a bit of a bang and it seems to be loud all the way through. So don't be surprised, but this is Haley and her interpretation of listening to God. <laughs> this creator God that we're called to worship, this time of COVID-19 has allowed us to pause, to reflect on the vastness of who God is. We've been allowed time to reflect and ponder the limitations that we were putting on the vastness of God before. 
And now we're, we're discovering that creativity of God again as creative beings. He's calling us to worship him, our creator. God's calling out that creativity in being. So we don't get too comfortable of how we do church, but in worship him in different facets of who he is. I think we need to go back to scripture when we think about worship and look at how detached we've come from that. Eugene Peterson puts in Romans 12, here's what I want you to do. Take your everyday ordinary life and place it before God as an offering, your eating, walking, sleeping life and place it before God. That's true worship. We now have the opportunity to embrace that vastness of worship, move outside of the structures that we've inhabited for so long. Does that mean that we have to move our worship outside of the building um, in order to develop new structures or not have any structures at all? And I guess the answer is yes and no. Um, there, there's a beauty in having a building. There's a beauty of setting aside sacred space. But also, we don't need to allow that to limit us. And just as there is no limit on God and his grace, so there should be no limit in the way we experience that grace. So yes, let's take it out in the streets. Let's embed it in homes, but let's take it to our workplace. Let's take it with us wherever we go and see that as sacrificial worship rather than something we do in a physical building. I guess that starts by acknowledging that God is already about doing his work and we just have to uh, see and seek where God is already moving. So much of what we've done in the past and do now is program led. Come to the building, come here. Programs are great, buildings are great, but there's something about the heart of God where, where his mission is being expressed in different ways. What's fascinating is in Iran, the church is growing massively. It's, it's rapidly growing and they don't have church buildings. That's something that we can all learn from. And, and here there's a church uh, in Cardiff where um, refugees just kind of end up because it's right in the centre of town. And lockdown's not been an issue for many of them. Obviously, there's been issues around housing and, and conditions. But in regard to expressing their faith and telling others, this is no biggie for them. They are just doing what they've always done, and that's meeting together, experiencing Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, worshiping God in his vastness, and then sharing other people. We can learn a lot from that. So mission kind of post COVID out of our buildings would, would look like being in and out of each other's houses. We'd be releasing the gift of hospitality, honoring our guests over ourselves. It would force us back into a marketplace. It would force us back into structures that are known to us, that are familiar to us, that we would need to bring God into. What's fascinating in the early churches, they, they just went along to where they were normally going. They hung out with each other and there brought Jesus into it. As they were walking down the street, they saw a missional opportunity to proclaim the gospel in deed and word. For years, the church, the Baptists have prayed those powerful words, your kingdom come, your will be done. I believe God in mission is calling us to live a life worthy of God's kingdom. And that means that we uh, allow justice to roll out. So much of what we've done in mission is for those that are like us. And I believe God is calling us now to listen to him, to hear his voice, to hear his cry for justice for those on the sidelines. No more. And we cross the road but embrace 
his love for everyone. I believe God's uh, challenging me uh, in how we reimagine church and our life together. So much of church has been about a crowd, about getting people in, getting people together. And I believe God's asking us to reimagine what community is, uh, to go back to the biblical foundations of church. Church is not some ideal that we've made up, it's God ordained. Yet what we've developed over time isn't necessarily God's desire. One of the privileges I have as a regional minister is chatting to ministers. Uh, and over the past few months, um, just phoning and chatting to ministers, I've seen a real difference. I've heard a real difference in their voice. Before, when I used to meet them at ministers' gatherings, they used to tell me how many people would come to their church, what they were running as a program. Uh, what that was like you know we had so many on a Sunday so many come to messy church that was the definition of their church and that seemed natural it's what I did as well but now ministers are telling me people's names I'm hearing much more oh so and so has now accessed this I've been praying with this person I'm noticing in the language we're using far more we're noticing people's names and not being fixated on numbers and programs. God calls us into deep community. We mix alongside people on a Sunday, but that's not enough. We need to go deeper, care about each other. A community built on a foundation of the knowledge of the grace of God sharing that common story and doing life together out of that context. I think this takes a lot of soul searching when we move away from the crowd. What was really interesting when COVID-19 happened and churches stopped, some people, some ministers, all of a sudden lost their identity because they couldn't meet with people. And I like to be liked. <laughs> I like people to tell me I'm doing a good job and that's okay but there's also that element that it shouldn't be the thing that we strive for it shouldn't be the thing that validates us and so for us as ministers we have to delve deep into ourselves and get our affirmation and validation from God and not from a crowd. I love the fact that we disagree, but my main aspiration is that in our differences, in our disagreements, we would be a movement that cheer each other on. Imagine what our movement would look like if we preferred each other's needs over our own. Imagine what our movement would look like if we allowed the Holy Spirit to disrupt us as individuals, our structures and our way of being. I believe God is already about doing it. He's shaking the system. He's shaking us as individuals, causing us to question. I think there's an element that we don't cheer each other on as we can because we're focused so much inwardly on our individual church and our individual congregation. We don't have the time or space to do that. But wouldn't it be amazing if we weren't focused on what we were doing as an individual church, but individual communities, and actually we share our best practices, we share the mistakes we've made, we do life together. Our independence, is as marvellous as it is, is also something that cripples us in so many ways. We need to be better at resourcing each other, being with each other. 
my aspiration, my prayer, is that we would be a movement that is known for encouraging, a movement that is known for blessing others, encountering the difference in a good way, enabling God's spirit to move amongst us, not worry about our reputation, not worry about getting it wrong, being the movement that hangs out with those on the sidelines of community. Imagine what that would be like if everyone looked at the Baptist movement and said, wow, don't they love each other in a really crazy way? That's what our, my aspiration for our movement is, that we would be the movement that cheers each other on despite the differences that we have. that idea that we cannot limit God. God is not to be limited. And however limited we feel at the moment, God is not limited. But it's challenging as well. The structures that we have, the things that we do, our first response is often to hold on to what we have, and rightly so, in our, in our personal lives and our church life as well. And maybe Haley's right. Maybe God's challenging us to release that and say, I want you, as she says, to be with those on the fringes of our societies. But what will church look like after lockdown? Perhaps it's not a crowd. Maybe it is being in and out of each other's houses. But I don't know about you, that raises all sorts of emotions in me. It makes me fearful of what the future might be excited and challenged I quite like a challenge but fearful as well so we're going to sing and remind ourselves that Jesus is our friend at anything that challenges us maybe it's whether it's what our future church will be like or whether it's something a bit more personal to you we can bring it to Jesus in prayer so that's what we're going to sing now what a friend we have in Jesus and remind ourselves that he really is our friend. <laughs>
take a moment and know that God holds all of your fears and worries and anxieties and there is nothing that you can't bring to him in prayer. So whatever the future holds, we are also held safely. I mentioned going to college with Haley. I went to Spurgeon's College and their motto in Latin is I hold and I am held. And I felt at the time how appropriate that was for a college which trained ministers, but it's also appropriate for us as well. We are held by God and we hold others. We hold them in our prayer, but we also hold them safe and secure because we have Jesus in us. We're going to learn a little bit more about that now. Now, on my list, I have um, Pam T giving the reading, but um, as Pam T doesn't seem to be with us this morning, unless somebody can point me in her direction, I can't see her. So I'm going to do the reading this morning. So the reading is from 1 John. If you've got a Bible, then it's good to have it in front of you. Something I've noticed about our Zoom services, that so many more of us have a Bible with us. This is towards the end of your Bible. It's almost completely at the end. It comes just before Revelation, these three little letters written by John. So as we already have a gospel called John, this is, these letters are called 1 John, 2 John and 3 John. A really creative use of uh, language there. So this is 1 John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 7 to the end of verse 17. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you've heard, yet I'm writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says I am in the light while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light and in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates another believer is in the darkness walks in the darkness and does not know the way to go because the darkness has brought on blindness. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him, you know him from him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you fathers, because you know who, him who is from the beginning. I write to you young people, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world, for all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride in riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. Father God, as we open up your words, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts Reveal your will and your way and your word. 
and be a blessing amongst us, we pray. Amen. I was away for a week. I was away for two Sundays, but it was really just a week. And so much happened in that, in those two, in that week and those two Sundays. We almost, almost have a new US president. Lockdown happened. The hour had changed and we suddenly became aware of more darkness. Halloween happened at the beginning of that week, a time when the world celebrates darkness and all things from the dark unknowingly. And the church celebrates the following day, All Souls Day or All Saints. There was firework night, well, except it didn't really happen, did it? And this weekend, we've had Diwali, where the Hindus and the Sikhs in our communities have celebrated their festival of light. The darkness seems to be more prevalent and the weather hasn't helped. It was so dark yesterday, we had the light on almost all day. Perhaps we're just more aware of the darkness, not just the physical darkness of the days and the night, but that oppressive darkness that creeps into our souls without invitation. When we focus on what we can't do and what we don't have, when the difficulty or loneliness or sheer boredom of our days wrenches our eyes from Jesus. It happens to all of us. There's no con condemnation intended. When I chose this passage, I was looking forward to Christmas, and yet it seems so appropriate that all of these dark things have happened because this passage focuses on the light. John's dealing with the topic of living in the light, just as Johnny said at the top of our service, when he talked about picking up a seed and seeing the potential in that for growth and light, rather than the dead leaves that surround us, beautiful though they are. Now in Hebrew literature and theology, the light was a metaphor for good, for God and for God fearing. And the darkness was used to describe sin and godlessness and apartness from God. We find this image throughout the Old Testament and into the New, where John, the gospel writer, calls Jesus the light of the world. And Jesus himself is recorded as telling his believers, you are the light of the world. Don't we need to hear that at the moment, that there is light in the world? Light from Jesus? Light in us because of Jesus that we also can share with our brothers and sisters, our families, our friends, our communities. Our days are short. We in the Northern Hemisphere love our long summers where we can still sit outside at nine o'clock at night and we hate our dark winters when the few hours of sunshine or daylight that they seem to be seem to be filled with cold and damp and perhaps the darkness of lowering clouds. How good is it to hear that there is light that isn't affected by the length of the day, that isn't affected by the rising and the setting of the sun. How marvellous, how marvellous it would be if we can be the means of shining the light of love, of hope, of God into the darkness. In these days of transition, when we're wondering what will the new normal be and keep directing that beam, keep it focused on the dark corners of the lives of our friends and families, keep shining it into our society and our structures. We are a society which creates light a lot. I spent some time yesterday thinking about Christmas and thinking about how I would celebrate it at home, thinking about how I would decorate the house 
and maybe it was because of the darkness of the day, I decided I needed to put up lots of lights, battery lights, perhaps plug some in, light some candles. I wanted light in my darkness. Now, I think that said more about where I was at that time, and perhaps it's somewhere where we all are. And maybe that light of a Christmas light or a candle seems dim and dark. Perhaps when we compare it with the lightness and brightness of our society, our little light seems to shine dimly. But our little light is unextinguishable. Our light persists. We're in society, we're in the world. The light and the dark which surrounds us, it fluctuates. Those places which have been the most bright are now sometimes the most dark. Those people who have shone most brightly find themselves in the darkest places. And yet the light of the love of God persists. We as Christians have something that the world needs so much and doesn't even know it. John's talking about the light of the world in his letter. He said that God is light. And the conditions for living in that light are twofold. The renunciation of sin, turning away, turning our back, and obedience to the will of God. I have an old commandment for you, he says. One that they've known forever. One that they've grown up in. One that God has instigated. Love one another. What does it feel like to grow up in the knowledge of something? I wasn't brought up in church. But what does it feel like to grow up in the knowledge of something that seeps into your soul and your being? Sometimes for us going to church, all that stays imprinted on us is that structure of going to church. Him prayer, him talk, him whatever rather than the instructions of God through his word, the word in the Bible and the living word of Jesus, to love one another. And I spent some time thinking about what it must be to be so soaked in the knowledge of something that it stays with you no matter what. I'm going to show you something which might be familiar to you. It was on Twitter some weeks ago, and it's been around on most of social media and even in the news recently. It's a gentleman called Paul Harvey. He's a, he was a music teacher and a pianist, and he's suffering from dementia. His son goes to visit him, but he feels that his father is slipping away. There's less and less of his father with him. And so he challenges his father to remember that he's a pianist to remember that he used to compose music. And on one occasion, he did something which he'd done many times before. He gave his father four notes and asked him to improvise on those four notes. And he put it up on Twitter. You may know the rest of the story. It was seen by an awful lot of people. And eventually it was turned into a piece of music with the, I think it was the BBC Concert Orchestra. Let's have a look at what that looks like. Oh, a warning again, this again uh, ends with a bit of a crash. So I'll try and cut it off before it stops. It starts abruptly and it stops abruptly because that's how it was recorded. This is Paul Harvey. And the voice you'll hear is his son giving him the four notes to improvise on. Uh, F natural. A. D, B natural. There is your four notes. Do, 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 do. Thank you. 
beautiful? Isn't that the most beautiful thing? I've also been sent a, a thing this beginning of this week of a, a ballerina, a prima ballerina from the New York City Ballet, uh, now in a wheelchair and in her 80s and with Alzheimer's, listening to the music of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. And she was transported once again to be the ballerina that she was in her youth with poise and beauty. It was, it made me cry. For the ballerina and for Paul, they were so steeped in the music and the creation of that, that even in the, their Alzheimer's, in their dementia, it stays with them. What would it be like if the knowledge of God was so embedded in our souls that we could not help but love one another? I'm not giving you an, a new command, says John, and immediately goes on to say, I'm giving you a new command. Because it's now found in Jesus Christ, not because it's new, but because it's expressed in a new way because of Jesus. Love is new because God has shown his love for humankind by giving his son. Jesus, by his obedience, fulfilled the law, the summation of which was love. And Jesus makes it possible for the believer to inherit a new quality of eternal life and through him to fulfill the law of selfless Christ-like love. If the light is in us, the coming of Jesus is a light coming into the darkness. Knowing God, abiding in him and being in the light are parallel versions of a single claim to be in a right relationship with God, the Father, through the Son. The relationship that we've known all of our lives, that we've been brought up in maybe, the new relationship now translated and expressed in Jesus. God has loved us in Jesus. Indeed, God has demonstrated what that light looks like by the coming of Jesus. And therefore we can live in the light, which dispels all darkness. The love of God, which is demonstrated in the covenant relationship, which God enters into with his people is centered on the work and the person of Jesus. God loves us in Jesus, who is the Christ. And we're therefore called to love others in and through him. The context of this first section of John's letter is dealing with the tests for judging the genuineness of any claim to know God. Those who are genuinely children of God and abide in him and live in his love as Christ lives in them and becomes the light in them and they are able to love with the love of God and walk in the light always. Not a new command but an old one. A new normal, but still normal. John's writing to a church whose members, some of them are still living their old lives whilst claiming to be in Christ. This is not us. We have fought those battles more than once, if you're familiar with the history of our church. John speaks of these folks being in darkness, being blind. Where we are at the moment may be a feeling of helplessness or even hopelessness, but it is not darkness. We are not blind. Although we may not be able to see our way out, blindness is an attitude, a position taken up and taken up willingly. We're beginning to see that the church is not either or, my way or your way, it's both and. The church is where the light of Jesus shines from the people of God because of their obedience to the commands which have been the same since the beginning of time, but are now seen anew in Jesus. It's not just meeting in person or over Zoom, it's both. It's the phone call from a fellow Christian asking how we are, it's the pastoral watchers, it's the offer of shopping, it's the newsletter to keep us all in touch, it's the prayer pyramid and the prayer list, it's Sunday church and messy church, 
it's the ladies breakfast and first Friday and the children's work and carols by candlelight. It's all the activities of Hawfield Baptist Church and all the things that connect us together and connect us to God. And then we are walking in the night, light and the darkness will not overwhelm me. Let's pray. Father God, I will not be overwhelmed because your light shines in the darkness and shines in me. Father, help me to know that light and to walk in it always. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah.
Have you still got your Bible? As you look at your Bible, it might be laid out differently from mine. But the chances are, in the middle of that section of reading, there's a bit which is laid out a bit like a poem with repeated phrases. It looks like it should be sung. We're going to use it as our prayer and reflection this morning. Now, first, a word about the language. It seems to be addressed to all sorts of different people. It says little children and fathers and young people. John's a really excitable person. He started his letter with a big bang. Usually in ancient times, letters had a very formal start in the same way that our letters and emails now will say have addresses at the top of a letter, it'll have all sorts of information at the end of an email which tells you who the person is and what their job is and all that sort of thing. John has jumped straight in. Our reading today began with beloved. He uses these terms of dear endearment as he addresses those that the letter is to, and of course it's to us as well. He's not specifically writing to fathers and children. He's writing to everyone. There are perhaps two groups here. Perhaps the fathers is meant to be those who are more mature in faith and the children are those who are newer in faith. But what he says is for all of us. So you might like to have your Bible open. You might like to close your eyes and open your hands. I'm going to read it through again. And know that this is to you. Know that this is the reason that we have confidence in who God is. The reason that we have confidence in the light of Jesus. And then I'm going to read it again slightly differently. And remind us. So let's pray. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Father God, help us to hear that we are dear children, beloved. As we open our hearts and our minds now to these words, may your spirit come and plant that light in our lives. Your sins have been forgiven. You know God who is from the beginning and he knows you and loves you. You have overcome the evil one. You know the father. His love is embedded in your soul. You know Jesus who is from the beginning, the light of the world, shining in you and from you. You are strong because of God. The word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one.
Father God, encourage us. Help us to know that the light has come into the darkness. So that in a few weeks time, when we read the beginning of John's gospel as our celebration of Christmas, we will hear once again anew that Jesus, the light of the world, is shining in the world. Dispel our darkness, we pray. Therefore, we are not overwhelmed. We pray these words in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, we learned a new song. And I felt it would be good to do it again but it has so much wisdom in it as well, that Jesus is the lion. He is the lion of Judah. God is strong and capable, but he's also the lamb, the sacrifice, and the means of grace for our salvation. So I'm afraid my iPad has crashed. Uh, I will get it up again, but we will sing, he's coming on the clouds, the lion and the lamb. I've just got to find it. Here we go. Let's worship as we come to the end of our service. Stop. 
Let's pray. Father God, may your light come. May your light shine in us and through us. We pray that these truths that we've spoken this morning are embedded in our souls. Our sins are forgiven. That we know him. And that you have conquered the evil one. Father, may your light shine and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you peace. And may that peace, which passes all understanding, be with you and in you and around you all the days of your life. Amen. Our service is ended. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been lovely to be back. Been really nice.